Hello again. Uh, today's lesson, we're going to be dealing with rule number four, player equipment. Uh, this is found on page 21 of your rule book, National Federation High School rule book. Uh, remember, if you haven't gotten this by now, uh, it could be a disaster down the road, so please make sure that you have included this uh, for your, your classroom textbooks. Um, once again, you can get that National Federation of High Schools on the web, or you can come here to Murray State University's uh, bookstore located in the Curtis Center on the Murray State campus and find it there. Anyway, uh, dealing with pages 21 through approximately 28 of this particular rule, um, if any of these rules have major nuances, it's this one. And it's one that you really need to become familiar with. And by the way, I might take this opportunity to identify a couple things about this rule book, rules, if you would, that you'll find throughout the, uh, not only the course, but also as you get into soccer fishing. And that is that all of the situations that are identified in the book are therefore, you know, further edification, further verification, further clarification of the exact rule as it sits. The beauty of it, though, is, is that many of the test questions, quiz questions, come from those situations. So please pay particular attention to those situations as they uh, correspond to each one of these rules. Well, let's talk about player equipment. It, it's pretty simplistic, if you would. I uh, do need to mention to you that there are the four S's that go along with, or the five S's that go along with the, the rule itself. Those five S's include required equipment, shoes, socks, shorts, shirt, and shin guards. You can read about the specifics regarding the shin guards here in this rule. Uh, I actually had an opportunity as, as an author of one of these, uh, or an editor to one of these rules, deal with that specific aspect of this rule. But there is something that you do need to know about the 2013 soccer season, the upcoming one, as it relates to the high school season. It's right down here in uh, Article 1 of Section 1 of the very first part of the rule. Read this, if you would, and make sure that you understand it, that the home team shall wear white or light-colored jerseys, socks, and the visiting team shall wear dark uh, dark jerseys or socks. That pertained actually to last year. This year, beginning with the 2013 fall season, the home team shall wear solid white jerseys and solid white socks. The visiting team shall wear dark jerseys and socks. Okay? So, notice too that prior to and during the game, jerseys will be tucked in into the shorts unless manufactured be worn outside. Most soccer players like to have them worn to the outside. I, as a referee, choose against that. More about that later. It's pretty simplistic. Uh, this rule is not complex at all. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot to it, though, that you need to be uh, somewhat familiar with. As you go on in the rule, you'll notice that there are some very specific things about goalkeepers, illegal equipment, um, and what to do in that particular case. Uh, you know, who gets what in terms of cautions, if something's awry, that kind of thing. I think we need to kind of review some of that before we go on. For example, the goalkeeper must wear a distinctive jersey, that which differentiates him from his teammates and from the opponents. Okay? The jerseys must be numbered on the front and the back of either of the jersey and the shorts, and or the shorts. Uh, if it's on the front of the jersey, it doesn't have to be on the shorts. If it's on the shorts, it doesn't have to be on the jersey. In the front, that is, but they all have to be numbered. Uh, the goalkeeper's jerseys are not numbered, but must contrast, once again, with both teammates and opponents. The most important aspect of this rule, though, is the illegal equipment. For example, things like jewelry or joint braces, knee braces, ankle braces, uh, to be more specific, that have exposed metal parts. In addition to that, we have... Uh, the eyeglasses, uh, those guards, and then face guards are also identified and fairly well explained in the rule. But there are exceptions to this. Say, for example, a person is wearing a religious medallion. Well, that medallion has to be taped to the body or under the uniform if, in fact, the player re is required to wear it. Some religions do require that, okay? Medical alert jewelry must be, once again, taped and visible inside the jersey. Uh, or inside the uniform. Now, here's the key. Do you have to know about that? Not necessarily, but I mean, if a coach offers it or if a player offers it, you just have to check that out. You will not go looking for these things. Uh, ankle, bracelets, uh, ankle braces with metal uh, parts that are unaltered must be uh, covered by the sock. Must be covered by the sock in order to be considered legal. Anyway, read through a lot of that 
and uh, through this rule and read specifically those uh, situations. And I think you'll be very, very surprised at how simple this rule can be. Before we get into the next aspect of this thing about the what do you do if, let's take a look at some some of the pictures that we have here uh, for you that may be of value. Let me go ahead and bring this on up and we'll go from the beginning. I just need for you to see some of the pictures of the, and in this particular case, this last year's um, 2012 NC2A Division I Men's Championship between Indian and Georgetown. Uh, you notice that the referee in the background here uh, is different in color and needs to be, the fishing crew needs to be different in color from the players, goalkeepers, okay? Notice that the players, Indiana, of course, is in red and that uh, the Georgetown player is in some sort of a gray, um, beige, I don't know exactly how you describe that color, nevertheless, I know that the footwear uh, worn by the Indiana player here is probably making a mark. Anyway, as you look through that, uh, another picture, easy to see once again, uh, the differences between the two players. That's extremely important. Notice that the number 18 player of Georgetown has the uh, captain's armband on his arm. That is that is allowed, okay? But you can see how all this works out. You can see the shin guards in this particular case. Um, both players are easily distinguishable. I put this picture in for a variety of reasons. One, I want to make sure that you're aware of how the goalkeeper looks and how distinctive he is. Um, we've got the Indiana and Georgetown players. You can see both of them. And of course, the goalkeeper there in his distinctive jersey and its number. The NC2A is different, uh, so let's not get into that. I bring this picture to your attention for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, notice that he's got the captain's armband on, but the other one is he's got the gloves on. Avoid the gloves. In August and September, those things get so super nasty. So when they're coming through the wind and want to shake your hand, give them the fist bump. Yeah, that works out a lot better, to be very honest with you, okay? Uh, for the NC2A girls, uh, you know, North Carolina here playing. Um, one of the things that we have to watch constantly with, with uh, both men and women is that they like to tape things and think that they can leave jewelry on, bracelets on, and those things, and that everything's fine. Likewise with ear earrings. Um, when we do that and we allow them to play, we're in specific violation of that particular rule. Do not let them do that. I have seen injuries as a result of uh, the, the earrings. Okay, So uh, make sure that those all go out as well. I bring this to your attention for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, just to, to show you a little bit more. The, the kickoff has already been uh, blown here. You notice that we have the two taking the kickoff in the middle of the uh, of the, uh, of the circle, the center circle. Notice how big that is. Of course, that corresponds to uh, rule number one, the center circle with a 10-yard radius, okay, with the opposing players on either in their half outside of the uh, particular, um, uh, outside of the arc uh, on their side of the field, okay. And that's why that's there. I just want to show you how big that thing is. But you can also very quickly and very easily see uh, both teams, who's on what and so forth. You get the idea. Uh, here we go with uh, another shot, uh, identifying the fact that we've got both teams, in this particular case, easily identifiable, and that's the key. There is one piece to, though, to this that I suppose you can make an issue of, but I'd rather you not, and that would be uh, number 16's headband there in white, very similar in color to North Carolina's, uh, North Carolina's colors, if you would. Notice that the socks match, in this particular case, North Carolina's, and this particular picture has a couple of things going on with it. Once again, the wristband is there. Do not know what's why it's there, or what have you. It almost appears as if she's got a ring on. But I also want to show something else too. The other reason uh, that I, I bring this picture to your attention, and you'll see this in a subsequent picture. Take a look. Number five in the white is wearing the gold shoes. Uh, once upon a time, uh, a FIFA referee identified this person and all others that like to be distinguished by the shoes is Billy White Shoes, Billy Yellow Shoes, Billy Cute Shoes, Susie Cute Shoes, and those kinds of things. In many, many cases, during pregame, an easy way to distinguish some of your better players, perhaps, is by the color of the shoes that they wear. If they want to be singled out and distinguished, sometimes they're the ones that have the most expensive shoes with the most wild of colors. Watch for them in pregame and see if, in fact, that's not uh, something that may be taken to heart. Uh, you're going to see five again. 
Notice the hit ball here. Uh, we talked about uh, players and um, substitutions in Rule 3. This particular uh, situation, you notice where we have a head ball going on here. Uh, you might have some issues with that as a referee. You know, it depends on your perspective, depends on your field positioning, which we'll talk a great deal about later down the road. But you could also have a potential uh, injury for either one or both of these players. Once again, it's one of those things that you're going to have to pay attention to. Ah, there's number five again. And check out those shoes. Yeah, sure enough, um, you know, she's in the play, she's in the mix, and actually in, in the NC2A uh, D1 pictures uh, from uh, the game, you know, she's in several of them. I want to point out a couple of other things that you're going to read about in this rule, and that is knee braces. Theoretically, these are supposed to be um, covered, okay, with uh, closed cell, uh, slow recovery uh, padding, uh, although these don't have exposed metal parts that would be considered of sharp edges and create some problems for people that might run into them. Um, therefore, that would be a legal uh, knee brace like this one. You'll see these things. You'll see them a lot, more than perhaps you should. Another knee brace that we find uh, frequently on the field is one of foam padding, uh, closed cell, soft, uh, slow recovery uh, material that offers enough uh, support to the knee that in fact that the player feels comfortable enough to continue to play. How about some ankle brace pictures? You'll see these things. This person is elected to put this over a sock and then he or she will probably put a shin guard on and a sock over this. These are legal if they're covered by the sock. Okay. Just once again to support the uh, the player's ankle. I do want to break, uh, make another point about prosthetic limbs. Can you play with prosthetic limbs? The answer is absolutely you can, um, and that's not a problem. As long as you, the referee, make sure that uh, the pieces that uh, are, are employed with this thing are not dangerous to other players. If, in fact, you believe that they are, you're the final say-so. However, you need to use due diligence, caution, and common sense when it comes to this particular rule. This young lady plays uh, for uh, a school in Florida, I believe it is. But anyway, has been playing, and as you can see, she's a goalkeeper. We had a student here in the Paducah Tillman area that played uh, in goal uh, with a prosthetic limb. So anyway, uh, a real success story, pretty exciting, uh, you know, and, and we're you know real pleased that she was able to do that. Let me go ahead and get out of this. Go back to the front of the rules so that you can see, of course, once again, we deal with player equipment. Subsequent to this page and a few others in, you'll find that um, if we have a problem with this particular rule, for example, a player comes out uh, illegally equipped, has earrings in after they've been told to, to take them off, a ring or a bracelet or something of that nature, uh, and they've been told to remove those, prior to the game, yet they come out there and are ready to play, what do you do? Well, believe it or not, the head coach is responsible for this. And this is a, we, we made this rule change two years ago, and it's been a very good one. During pregame, it'll be your responsibility as officiating crew to ask the coach if, in fact, his players, his or her players, are legally equipped. And, and if they are, they'll obviously say, yes, they'll be, they're legally equipped or will be before they take the field. Fine. You've been told by the head coach that everything's fine and that will be fine. So therefore, if they come onto the field and they're not legally equipped, you caution the head coach first. Okay? So the head coach gets the first yellow card. Subsequent infractions of this particular rule go to the player. Head coach first, player second. Okay? So we, we kind of like that. Okay? Uh, the fun stops there, though because every subsequent infraction of that rule is awarded a yellow card which is given then to the player and that's extremely important for you to recognize and know. Um, what happens if you find a person that's illegally equipped on the field of play? You are going to at the next dead ball situations referee and crew stop the game, order the player from the field, by the way the coach can replace that player have them adjust the equipment and here's where the three-person officiating crew comes in extremely handy this is not the NC2A okay so in other words they can't come on and run a play if in fact the play the team plays short rather what you can do what you must do is you must have that equipment checked by um, 
they are one on that side of the field if in fact they can do that prior to that player coming back on to the field and at the next substitution instance that player can come on back in okay next legal substitution they can return okay I think that about has it once again I'm gonna go ahead and let you be responsible for reading this rule and once again I highly recommend that you become very familiar with the situations uh, of this rule and uh, you know you may find that in the quiz that some of the questions come directly from that so the next rule will be the referees okay and uh, the referee that is uh, this one has uh, some some very interesting nuances in it so until then